everybody and welcome to this show tonight. Uh, oh, I see something's happened. Oh, it always does. And why is this in shot? What craziness is this? Okay, let's just get you out of the way. Right, how is everybody doing? Um, let's see, what's been turned off? You know, I never, I, can, I always forget this stuff. There we go. There's chat. Hello, chat. Nice to have you with me on tonight. It's quite a chilly evening here in... Uh, the UK in London, but um, it's made all the warmer by your company. So thank you for joining me this evening. We're going to be answering your questions, talking about all that kind of stuff. Um, I see the topic within chat at the moment is quarantine and coronavirus. Absolutely. And it's affecting everybody, I guess. Absolutely everybody. I was supposed to fly to Japan at the end of the month and my flight has been cancelled by the airline. They're trying to get me another one, but it doesn't look like I'm going to get there, which makes me very, very, very sad. So anyway, it is what it is. The virus is affecting us. I hope all of you are safe and taking necessary precautions. Being stuck in a YouTube studio day in and day out, I suppose, is kind of a way of avoiding it. Certainly, it seems to be working thus far. Touch wood. Anyway, we've got a lot to talk about today, and one of them happens to be inspired by the coronavirus. A lot of us might not be able to get our games in, and I know certainly I have a, a club here that I play with, and um, I uh, they, they meet every Thursday night, and last week I was going, well, should I go, shouldn't I go? I have to take a bus to get there, and it kind of gets you a little bit worried. But then at the same time, there is that certain... Should one really let life get in the way of, of, of life? Otherwise, what are you really doing? Just hiding from it. Um, I, 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 I think it's about... I, th I think it's important to, to find a balance there somehow. And I don't know what the, the right answer is. So uh, if you do, let me know. Anyway, um, I hope I hope everyone is okay. So we're going to be talking about what you need in order to be able to play online if you want to get into it. If you feel that you need your RPG fix, I know everybody's been sending out messages on how to do it. So I've got some YouTube uh, Amazon links lined up to show you what I use. And uh, then you can decide whether you want to, to, to spend the cash and do it or not. Now, this is not to say that this is what you are absolutely required to have in order to online game, uh, role play, I should say. Uh, but it is what I use. So it's sharing is caring, as they say. So we've got that to talk about. We've got one last thing from the Bristol Gaming Convention to talk about, which is quite exciting. Um, because they're not based in Bristol, but in Nottingham, which uh, is a very different city altogether. So we're going to talk about that. I have something new to show you in terms of Kickstarters. Something quite exciting, actually. If you are in the dice collecting uh, storage space. So so that could be interesting. I see there Danny Kriegbaum Larsen says, uh, in order to play online, you need A, a group, B, uh, DDB. I'm not cool enough to know what that means. And roll 20. Um, allowed DD... Oh, D D D B B B Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that one. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons Beyond. Uh, yeah, so you could, you, could, you could certainly go that route. We're going to look at some of the options that you have available to you and some of the options that don't cost very much as well. So that's definitely, definitely uh, an, an option. Um, I see some old friends on chat. Uh, Lena Swartz, how are you doing? I'm doing very, very, very well, thank you. And the UK is uh, yeah, finally... Um it's starting to feel a little bit like home, actually. So there we are. D&D &D Beyond. Thank you for correcting me there. Game Master's Vault is here. Hola, nerds. Uh, hola, Game Master's Vault. Absolutely. Uh, since you are here, I'm going to show you this. Very, very excited. This is the hard copy of the book. It has arrived. I'm amazed at how thick it actually ended up being. And we, we were actually trying to cut down the number of pages so that it could keep the print cost low. But it's arrived, and um, it's our usual, usual beautiful book, thanks to Martin's layout. And uh, yes, I've been going through it slowly, as one does, looking for spelling mistakes, for alignment issues. Blurb is our printer of choice. They've really done a great job on this. The book looks absolutely beautiful. The colours are stunning. I mean, it looks, it looks exactly how we intended it to look. It's a good, solid spine. That glue is not going to come out. This was actually printed. What I like about Blurb is that this was printed here in the UK. So um, order to print and delivered was 10 days, 
which I thought was absolutely fantastic. So I've got to finish this off. And then if you have ordered a hard copy, your hard copy will be en route to you. I mean, this is one of my favorite spreads, the two ports, so the small port and then the large port on this side, looking absolutely beautiful. So um, that's Simon's artwork in there. Anyway, so I'm going to be going through this. If you did not order a copy, fear not, it will be available uh, for you to, to order your own copy. Uh, you can get the PDF on the website already, but bear in mind, if you're going to go for the hard copy, we're going to do what we did with the last one, and that is if you order the hard copy from Blurb, you send us an email and we'll give you the PDF free. So there we are. The cards have been sent off. The order cards have been sent off to a printer company if you want to get those as well. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff um, on that front. Super, super exciting. It's been a very, very, very dramatic weekend here, as a matter of fact. So yes, look out, look out for that. Um, right now, some options. There are a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of things that are going on in terms of of online role play. So if you want me to talk about what is it that one needs and what is it that one needs to do and all of that sort of thing, uh, let me know in the chat. You might say, "Oh, everybody knows how to play online. We're not old fashioned. We don't. We we don't. We we we're sorted. We don't need that kind of advice." Then absolutely. I will, I will move on and we will answer your questions. That's why we're here, is to answer your questions. So I'm not seeing a lot of questions yet. I think people are still kind of getting into the show. I did start it differently. Normally I start on the hour with the five minute countdown. Now I've started five minutes before, so we start on the hour, which I think works a little bit better. So there's our first question, White Tiger 225 Been with the channel for quite some time. Uh, White Tiger, I saw your comment earlier. Um, now, a uh, question from White Tiger 225 uh, My necromancer came out after a millennial dead thanks to the player actions. The players have already outsmarted him, all right, the big bad, but they still have not figured out one of them still carries part of his soul so he can resurrect whenever through their family line. What I'm asking is, do you think they will be mad if I spring that on them? I have hinted at it a lot, but they did not pick up on it, even outright told. If you have told them, if you have told them, then you are perfectly within your rights to have it spring out and come alive and take control and do all the diabolical things that it wants to do. If you've told them, if you've given them hints, then absolutely, absolutely, it is now the best time to, to release it and launch it and have fun with it. So there you go. Zanny the Green says, what would you call a minotaur centaur hybrid? A minotaur centaur hybrid is really just a moose, if you ask me. <laughs> um, yeah, a minosaur? It's going to be a maxi saw later on once it's finished charging. Oh, that was cheap. That was cheap, I know. Uh, but yes, what would you call a minotaur centaur hybrid? So the head of a bull, the torso of a man, and the body of a horse. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, who knows? Who knows what's going on? Uh, there we are. Uh, yeah, so if there's suggestions on what you call a minotaur centaur, well, drop them in the chat. Let's see what we can come up with. A mentor, says Sammy Critfiggle. Uh, fiddle, Sammy Critfiggle says, a minotaur centaur is a mentor. Well, you're sharper than I am. You are sharper than I am. Ten points to you. I see Game Master's Vault has found someone to take Stephen's spot. That's absolutely fantastic. And I know Stephen would be happy to hear that. Uh, we shall see what goes on there. Um, right, so AK Writer says, yes, he'd like to see what we use for online uh, streaming. There we go. Absolutely. We can talk about that. So that's one vote for that. Uh, Inky Design says, what is your favorite warm beverage in the wintertime? It is the same as my favorite warm beverage in summer. Good old fashioned coffee. But and this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily know until they've spent some time with me, in which case they run away. Do you notice the color of the coffee is almost the same as the color of the mug? That's because the mug's quite dirty, but the mug is actually white and the coffee is very similar to that. I drink the cheapest, nastiest, horridest instant coffee you can get. Used to freak the hell out of poor old uh, Game Master's vault. And it's like, well, can I just put coffee powder into hot water in the coffee maker rather than actually using the coffee 
maker. Yeah, it's really just a, a delivery system for the milk. So that's my favorite drink. And now I have to have a sip. Moving swiftly along, Beat J says, I would like to hear about good platforms to play online. There we are. We are four healthcare professionals in my group, so meeting up in person at the moment isn't an option. No, absolutely. Um, so yes, all right, that's second vote. Fatizinhao Shu Shu Shu. I'm not sure how we pronounce that. Should we, the GMs, worried much about NPCs' name and store names, or is it silly to get always the perfect name for everything? There are a couple options that you can take on this. Now, obviously, when the PCs walk into town and they say, oh, I look for a, a, a tavern or I look for a store that sells boot nails. It's important when they walk up to the front to realize that, um, or they might say, oh, what's it called? And then you have to come up with a name on the fly. It can be tricky and you can kind of go, oh, it's the hobnail and I. I don't know if anyone gets that movie reference. 10 points to you for watching that old film. Anyway, um, the, 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 the idea of coming up with NPC names, I think, is very important. And something that absolutely works for me really, really well when I'm stuck is just think of someone in your own life or an actor or a character from a film that you think would go quite well as the NPC and then take the name and then swap the name around. So uh, let's say you want them to encounter some elderly, slightly crazy knight and they say, what's his name? And you go, okay, his name is, uh, his name's John Lucky. Um, Pukane, Pukane, John Lucky Pukane. John Lucky Pukane, and he has a big white, big nose, balding head with white hair around the edge. He's quite wrinkly, but quite handsome in an old kind of way. Uh, so there we go. I've been watching Star Trek all afternoon. So Jean-Luc Picard becomes John Luck, Lucky, John Lucky Pukane, because that's how it works. And so what it does is it allows you to remember, oh, they met Jean-Luc Picard, whose name was actually John Lucky. So John Lucky is there and he's going to chat to the PCs. So you can do that. And you can do the same thing with stores. So try that out for a thing. Uh, Dracone says, how is the Save or Dice crew doing? Dracone, I have been in touch. Well, I actually haven't since moving to the UK because time zones are all over the place. David Fryant from Nerdarchy, he and I are still thick as thieves. Um, I'm looking forward to Nerdarchy Con in October. I'm hoping this coronavirus thing has sorted itself out by then. I really do hope that it has uh, has cleared itself up by Gen Con, as a matter of fact. But yes, um, so he's doing very, very well. I know Michael Hunt has got a new show that he's busy doing. I'm not sure what um, the Ginger Ninja is up to. I don't know what she's doing at the moment. Um, and um, Cody's still releasing his videos. I know he's doing all kinds of wonderful and new things. But uh, yes, yeah, since moving to this space, time zone's a little bit a bit a bit up in the air at the moment. Um, there's another vote for how do we play D and D. There we go. All right, so absolutely. Um, Game Master's Vault was seriously considering buying a cow. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Big Trev Eight says, "What are some cultural things for the Dragonborn race that I can use as a role playing tool, tool like a tradition or common hobby?" One of the things that I think you need to identify first is what is the culture like for your Dragonborn in your campaign? I can't speak to the Dragonborn in the various settings that D&D has released. I haven't read any of them. And even if I had, I would convert them to my own anyway, because that's that's what I do. So when you're looking at the Dragonborn, what sets them apart from other cultures? So if you want a shorthand, if you want something that really punctuates the difference between dragonborn and say halflings is dragonborn have got scales so what what could you do as a dragonborn that you couldn't do as a halfling so off the top of my head something that can be very very um indicative of their warm-blooded yet reptilian background and it's always tricky because i know a lot of people go oh dragons are warm-blooded but they're reptiles and they're, they're, they're more like dinosaurs which makes them more like birds than Anyway, it doesn't matter. Whatever your dragonborn are, cold-blooded, warm-blooded, they have scales. That much we can all agree upon. And what that means is, is they could have the custom of scaling 
quite literally where a group of dragonborn get together and they brush each other's scales to get rid of old scales, loose scales, because scales shed. So I could see that as being something that they do together culturally. The young men, because men are gross, could probably actually collect those scales and see who shed the biggest one. Or then use them as chips in gambling or card play. Something along those lines, because that is something that's unique to the Dragon Ball. They are scaly. So scaling could be a cultural activity that they do. Something along those lines. I always like to look at that because if you're going to include it into your game, you want to include it in your game in such a way that the players go, oh, well, that's, that's pretty cool, actually. Oh, that's totally gross. And yet it fits within that kind of space. So if you said all oh, this around playing poker, you go, well, yeah, humans sit around and play poker. That's not particularly unique. So there we are. Okay, next, 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 next. Um, uh, Grizzle says, do you go over the comments on the uploads of Hello World with Kaora? Do I go over the comments on the uploads? Um, I have been looking at them. I have to moderate them all. I did read some of them. I can't say I've read the latest batch from this, from yesterday's, as a matter of fact. So I'll have to go back and have a look at that. Um, hopefully, hopefully there's nothing that I need to be worried about, I hope. Anyway, now you've got me worried. It's like, well, maybe we should just end the stream now and I'll go and check those. Anyway, so yes, I, I do check the comments as best as I can. I usually do that during the week. Uh, next question, Paco Ruiz says, um, I'm DMing for the first time to a group. Yes, awesome, well done. But I'm interested, uh, we are interested in pulp, and I don't know an adventure to hook them into role-playing. Uh, the problem is, I, the problem is that I'm prepared to D&D, but they don't like it. Why don't you do Call of Cthulhu? You don't have to do D&D. Don't do D&D, do Call of Cthulhu. Or if you really want to use D&D because you know the system... Just make it D&D Cthulhu. Make it feel more like Cthulhu, because that's really pulpy. Um, alternatively, my favourite system, D20 Modern. There are copies floating around. They're out of print now, but there are copies floating around. Um, and um, D20 Modern had a, an expansion called D20 Past. And that book dealt specifically with the 1920s, the 1890s, Victoriana, which is perfect for running a pulp kind of game. And if you want advice on how to run pulpy style games, head on over to the YouTube channel run by Seth Skorkowski. Seth Skorkowski. He does a whole... Well, he is the Cthulhu expert and he really, really does some, some excellent, excellent, excellent videos. Uh, Empire of Rage says, I'm a first time DM, fantastic, and I've just got the Essentials kit recently. That's fantastic. But still feel a bit overwhelmed with everything, everything I see. Do you have tips for learning of the rules on the fly? The rules for Dungeons and Dragons are really easy. If the character is trying to do something which you think stands the chance of failing, and the failure has a negative outcome or a positive outcome, but the failure has a potential to change the course of action. So the character wants to ride a horse down a flat road. There's very little chance of falling over. There's no reason whatsoever for them to fail. And even if they did fail, they'd fall off their horse and they'd get back on again. So every time the character wants to do something and has the potential to fail, you ask them to roll the d20. They roll the d20 and then they add a skill or they make a dexterity saving throw, but they basically just add the skill that is associated with whatever it is they're trying to do. So my advice for how to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons quickly is to remember you take a d20 and you roll it, you add a number from the character sheet skill list. So learn what those skills encompass and it will make your life a lot easier. Because the character tries to do something, that's great. Roll it, add the appropriate skill value. Did you beat my target number, which should be, if they're level one, somewhere around 12. If they're higher than level four, make it 15 and just go from there. You'll get, you'll get a feel for it. That's it. There we go. That's Dungeons and Dragons in a nutshell. Roughly. And anything else is just fluff on top. <laughs> there we are. Uh, AK Writer says the scales of their leaders could become something like office badges. Yeah, they could collect... Oh, God. That's awfully, awfully macabre. Oh, oh, we just dropped a big scaly one. Do you see that over there? I'm going to pick it up as soon as he walks away. Oh, look at that. I've got a nice big scale now. I'm going to put that on my chest. Oh, look at that. I'm going to touch that little scale of our leader. He's so brilliant. Oh, that's awful. Absolutely awful. Um, Euphonic says, What do you think about running two independent parties of five through the same dungeon at the same time? Are you intending to collide them together? 
uh, have them fighting each other, in which case it's a logistical challenge. Good luck with that. It can work. It just takes a lot of setup. Or are you just running the same module twice, in which case absolutely it will be fascinating to see how the two parties start at the same point and then do that. I have a module called Return to Braxia. I've run it twice now, once at Bristol and once at the club. Both times they kind of ended up at the same point at about the same time as well. But how they got there was completely different. It was awesome to see that and to see where it went in those different directions. Okay, how are we doing for time? We've still got some time. We've still got some time. Right. Now, um, Monster Ram says, have you ever played Rifts? And if so, did you like it? I haven't played Rifts. I really haven't. My housemate is busy looking into savage worlds and is extolling its beauties and values. And um, to be perfectly honest with you, I have also been looking around going, well, what's the next one? What's the next one? I'm trying to see. Uh, a lot of it is basically me going, I really need to finish writing off my own system and then we'll go from there. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Digger the Cornflex says, are you excited for Baldur's Gate 3? I'm mixed. I'm mixed for Baldur's Gate 3. I have not played Baldur's Gate 1 or Baldur's Gate 2. I own Baldur's Gate 1, but um, I'd rather just roleplay than actually play the computer game, because in the roleplay I can burn down the castle and, you know, do whatever it is that I want to do. Baldur's Gate 3, I have seen the trial, the, the, the demo thing where the poor man, everything went wrong, and he he, he did a very good job of, of, of running that game. Um, <clears throat> why am I worried? I am worried because that will cause a whole new wave of people who play that game to go, oh, I want to play Dungeons and Dragons, the role-playing game, the tabletop game. They'll go and play that. But did you see how it was showing all of the mechanics that were running? Now, I know Neverwinter Nights did it, and I know Neverwinter Nights 2 did it. They show all of the mechanics that are happening in the background, and they give you statistical probabilities of what your chances are to hit. Now, all that maths exists in the tabletop space, but that's not the point of the game, in my opinion. So I'm really worried about a whole bunch of new players coming in going, oh, well, you've only got a 27% chance of doing that. So uh, you could try, but um, maybe you shouldn't try. It's, it's so metagame. It's like the mechanics should be invisible. They shouldn't be determining things. You should use them as, as guides, not as controllers. Watch my video from this week, last week, as a matter of fact, in terms of what controls who and who controls what. Anyway, um, I don't know. It looks beautiful. It really does. And as a computer game, it could be quite fun uh, to play. But again, just play with your friends. The graphics are better anyway. So there we are. Burgosaurus Rex says, tips on filling out a backstory for NPCs. My group wants to talk to everyone. Okay. Um, I have a video somewhere, somewhere on how to do dialogue on the fly. Dialogue on the Fly. I think it's called NPC Dialogue on the Fly or just Dialogue on the Fly on the, our YouTube channel. You're on the channel now. You can go and look for it. It's literally, I think it's, I think it is literally Dialogue on the Fly um, or Making Up Dialogue or NPC Dialogue, something along those lines. There are eight things, I think it's eight things that P NPCs think about. And in terms of your backstory, that will help create your backstory for your NPC. So you can go and do that. Otherwise, on my website, uh, www.greatgamemaster.com, you can pick up the templates for the NPCs and um, you can see what they should have as their backgrounds, whether they're a long-term NPC or a short-term NPC. Don't stress yourself too much about preparing backgrounds beforehand. It's much more fun to make the backgrounds up on the fly as the characters are talking to them. And then if the characters come back to them later on, then you know, oh, hang on a moment, you might have a hook here. And so far as the players like that NPC, and so they're going to want to bond with that NPC. That is adventure gold mine. You should then develop that NPC and then use that NPC later on to then drive them forward. So that's my advice there. Okay, now before I get on to any next questions, before I get on to any next questions, so if you have asked questions, so Honourable 596, Watcher 2417, uh, White Tiger 225, uh, Honourable 596 again, Tropico Boy, all of you, please keep your questions, keep your questions, because a lot of people have been talking about Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds, da 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 Let's jump into that very quickly. We're going to spend five, ten minutes, and we will then jump away from that. So please copy your questions, Control A, Control C, or however you want to do it, and we're going to jump into, into that. So critically, for online play, 
if you are going to use your body parts to do it. And by body parts, I mean your voice primarily and your ears, because those are the two things you should be using for role playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of thing. You need to have good audio. That's the first thing. And a lot of people, I cannot tell you how many people there are who think that good audio is uh, audio that sounds like... Uh, oh, I can't really hear you. What, what are you talking about? Please speak up because you don't know what's going on. Well, I, sorry. That's awful. Absolutely, absolutely awful. You want a decent quality mic. So of the things I'm going to show you, if you spend just on the microphone, that's a good thing. If you want to do video, and video is really, really, really useful because the whole thing about role playing, the whole thing about role playing is body language and connecting. And as a GM, you want to be able to express how the NPCs are hunched or standing. Audio is going to do that. Video helps push it even further. Okay, so this is what I've got for you to have a look at. I have no affiliation with this company. I don't make anything. This is one of the cameras you can use, the Logitech C922. Um, the C920 is what I'm currently using, but it's slightly more expensive. Um, I'm sorry, these prices are all in pounds. So, so you'll have to deal with that. But yes, this is the camera. It's... Um, it's, it works really, really well. Like you can see here, there are the C920s. Uh, basically, it's the same camera. It's just slightly more expensive. These are the used ones, I think. I wouldn't buy a used webcam. They're, they're really not, not that pricey. Here you can see the full list. There's the C922 and there's the C920. It's a bestseller for a reason. Um, and, and it works really well. So you grab one of these. Then you go to your audio, and this is what I'm using, the Samson Meteor USB microphone. A lot of people say, oh, you've got to go for the Blue Yeti, which is the same shape and style, but it's more expensive than this one. Do you need to have all these shields? And this is called a pop shield. Now, the reason why they invented pop shields was for professional performers who stand right in front of the microphone. Now, I am a voiceover artist. So when I say they stand right in front of the microphone, I mean as in they stand right in front of the microphone, which means that any air that one is expelling, if you have serious P's that you have to pop because you need to punctuate your perfect sentences, you might need a pop shield. But when you're playing online and your microphone is sitting over here, I can pop as much as I personally prefer because I don't need to worry the p is going there, not into the microphone. So you don't need a you don't need a pop shield. You really don't need a pop shield. Trust me. Trust me. Okay. So there you are. Now that's the Samsung Meteor. If you're going to have video, you then just need one of these, a little LED ring light. So the total that is going to set you back is about two hundred pounds. Or what's that? Two hundred and twenty dollars, two hundred and thirty dollars. If you want to get something that gets you a nice, bright, well illuminated image, and that allows you to 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 play online, basically. Now, when we start talking about the software, this is where it gets really, 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 really tricky. The software is up to you and your group. You don't need software. You can role play without it. As a matter of fact, I used to prefer that where you have your dice, I have my dice, um, and you would roll the dice and tell the GM what you got. It's as simple as that. It's an honor system. It's the simplest, cleanest possible way that you can do it. What do you use for multi-video conferencing, however? That's where it gets a little bit more tricky. You can try and use Skype, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with Skype. It works fairly well, and it's free. You can use something that I use, which is called Zoom. Zoom will give you a free call between two people for as long as you like. Between five people, it gives you 45 minutes. Then you have to start paying for it. So we have a professional license, so we can just yak on and on and on and on and on forever. But that is the Zoom option. Now, I have run games that have lasted for six hours on Zoom with nary a problem. It has worked perfectly. The alternative, and this is a relatively newcomer to the game, is Discord. Discord offers video calling. 
There is a big challenge with the way that Discord works, however. It chooses a server that's between most of the callers. And so as a result, if you've got people in the US and you've got people in, say, Europe, your server might be located for randomnessnessness in the middle of London, meaning everyone's calling into London and then the call is going back. If your internet connection is not brilliant, that can cause problems. Now, if you want to go to the very final step, which is having a green screen and all that kind of stuff, you need to have lots of lights, or at least two lights anyway, and a green screen behind you. You can then use some of the software like Skype or, or Zoom to key it out. That's to remove it and replace it with a background. If you really want to, you again, though, I would advise using something called OBS. It's what we use. OBS is what drives this whole thing. OBS allows you to insert backgrounds and to control things. However, bearing in mind, this is not a simple process. And I have spent many, many hours with many, many, many people chatting, chatting away, trying to figure out why their computer won't get their webcam into their OBS and the OBS out into Zoom or into wherever it happens to be going. It can be tricky. So for role playing online, the best thing is you don't need it. You don't need these green screens. I mean, they look very pretty and that kind of thing. Of course, a bedroom is not really great. And I had a whole bunch of videos on that, so I, I wouldn't look at that. But again, the technology hasn't changed in three years. Discord's the new player, relatively speaking. But uh, there we go. So that's the basics. Then you go, well, do we need to have Roll20? Do we need to have Fantasy Ground? And which is better between Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds? I've used Fantasy Grounds. I like Fantasy Grounds. They've been a sponsor of the channel uh, for a long, long, long time as well. I don't think they're, they're no longer sponsors at the moment, but that's because we're not running any games. It does work as a basic system, and the GM is the only one who needs to have a subscription, or at least not to have a subscription, to actually own the software. All the players it can be played for. Uh, free of charge. Now, Roll20, of course, is very, very different beast. It's a lot more technical. There's a lot more controls that go into it. And I first started playing with Roll20 before Fantasy Grounds, and it certainly did what it needed to, but there was a big barrier to entry as far as I could see it. Certainly, Fantasy Grounds got a barrier to entry as well. So it's about choosing those. And then there's a whole bunch of new ones that are coming out. Some really, really, really awesome looking one. Tailspire is very exciting. There's some other ones that I'm involved with, which I'm really, really excited to see where it's going to go. I see chat is, is doing a whole lot of uh, chatting about the various setup that they use. I love that. It's brilliant. That's what this whole thing is about. Um, it is about sharing and caring. And, and there we go. Um, yeah. Now, um, so the whole idea of online role play, for me, the biggest challenge is that you don't have the people sitting around the table and that is something that we like to to it's something that we like to do it really is something that we like to do so yeah um it's going to be interesting it is it, it is interesting role playing online it isn't like the real thing but it allows you to connect and allows you to talk and allows you to 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 do stuff that you can't do at the current moment in time because it means leaving and going out and, and all that kind of stuff so if you have any further questions just ask on the chat and I will happily, happily answer. But that's basically the whirlwind of of what uh, what was going on. Now, before I, I'm going to take some questions, we'll do some questions for another six minutes and then we'll go on to, to something else. So if you ask questions, ask them again now, please. Um, Honorable 596 says, how would you pl role play a faction whose main goal is to improve the human race? Transhumanism, not socialistic, by any means necessary. Well, they have to have a reason for it. And it can't just be to make the human race better. It usually is with an outcome, to make it stronger, to make it resistant, to make it morally better, to improve its quality of life, to extend life so that we can do more. There needs to be a driving motivator underneath that. And that should be their central goal. So if you look at it, it's a case of uh, we want the human race to be a pure strain where there's no genetic deformities, there's no genetic inherited traits that are going to cause susceptibility to viruses or that is going to cause um, the individual to have a propensity for violence if that's something that you believe is genetic. And so there we go. The, the, the idea is that there needs to be a driving purpose behind it. Once you find that purpose, you then figure out how they go about finding individuals with that and then getting them into the program. Uh, 
Josu Ramirez, Hosu Ramirez, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, says, I've been a DM since last summer. That's great. I don't like the idea that the animal companions and familiars are druid ranger wizard specific. What is your take? Is it okay for others to have pets? I absolutely think it's, I, I absolutely believe it's awesome for others to have pets. I don't see why they shouldn't. There's no rule saying that they can't have pets. The ability, the bond, the connection, however, that those different classes have with their familiars is part of the character class build. So if you're worried about balance, it's basically like saying, well, I think every wizard should also be able to have a second wind, like the fighters. Or I think every wizard should be able to have backstab, like the thieves. It's part of the class build. So if you want them to have the innate connections, then you need to figure out how to balance it. But if you just want to allow people to have, well, this is my dog, and my dog knows three tricks, and none of them involve telepathy or me being able to control it from a distance where it can't hear me, then absolutely, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay, Rubik says, how do I handle a somewhat religious PC that thinks all of his actions are okay? If he kills some NPCs, he just gives his temple gold, even if it's gold from a dead person. Well, what are the what are the tenets of the god? What are they? Does the god say it is okay to slay those, steal their money, or take the money from the dead and give it to the church? It's entirely... This sounds to me like the church is sanctioning it. If they're taking the money and it's blood money, then that's, that's, that's on them. If they don't know that it's blood money and they're taking the money, I would very, 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 very much suggest that you have an avatar of the god appear, perhaps and say, as a dream, or as a vision, or as someone that the PC kills and then gets up, or the money that the PC starts taking from the corpses turns to dust in their hand. Symbols, messages from the gods saying that this is not okay. I would do it. So I would always do it in game. Absolutely. You could even have a priest saying, where did you get this money from? It's very unusual for someone to hand over so much money all the time. And if the PC says, well, I kill people and I give it to you, that is completely against the tenets of the faith. It's completely wrong. Oh, well done, my lad. Go kill more people. Bring us more cash. That's an interesting one. Uh, AJ Bernard says, what's the best way to integrate multimedia over an online video game, video audio using a Fantasy Grounds Discord platform? Any suggestions? What is the best way to integrate multimedia over an online game? Oh, I see. Okay. So you want to incorporate video and audio and that sort of thing. Again, it depends on how much on the fly you want it to be. I like to use OBS, of course, because then I can. If I've queued up some music, I can bring music in underneath um, the, the, the stream fairly easily. I've got controllers here. Um, if you're using something like some sort of audio desk, you can certainly do that. If you want to bring in video clips, well, again, it's easy enough with OBS. It's just literally OBS Studio. Can't go wrong with that. It's free to use and it works like a charm. Um, next, so uh, Derek G77 says, I'm waiting to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons, but I want my character to have some background elements involving Magic the Gathering. Would that conflict too much with a Dungeons and Dragons campaign? Derek G77, it is entirely dependent on what your game master says is okay. The person to ask there is them. They will have a setting, whether it's a D&D setting or it might be their own setting. They will listen to what you say and ask and perhaps they might incorporate it into their game or they might say, we're not playing from that particular setting of Magic the Gathering. Having said that, there are now, or will be soon, two Magic the Gathering D&D versions, basically, where D&D has taken Magic the Gathering settings and basically brought it across into the Dungeons and Dragons world. So that might be the best solution for you, is to go and have a look at those. I think one of them is Ravnica, and the latest one is Thesis, I think it is. Someone correct me. Someone someone get 500 experience points. What's the latest uh, D&D expansion called? It comes out June 22nd, I think. Uh, anyway, someone will find it and, and, and help my bad old brain 
Um, but yes, Theros, Theros, Ravnica, and the other is Theros. There we go. Holy crit, that was awesome. You get 500 experience points for Twitch. And Danny Kriegbaum Lawson, you get um, 500 experience points for the YouTube uh, space as being the first ones to get that out. Um, so uh, Shane Sankster and Catherine Bischoff close seconds there. Right, so, 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 I have to get the word so out of my vocabulary. I use it too often. Something that I was uh, encouraged to see at the Bristol Gaming Convention, and I had a chat to one of their representatives, who was very enthusiastic on getting me to move to Nottingham, is a gaming support thing, I think is the best way to uh, describe it, and it's called Protospiel. Uh, proto game basically now proto spiel is uh, not new it's all over the world from what i understand there's its website there proto spiel uh, this is the website for nottingham uk as it says there proto spiel nottingham uk but i do, do believe proto spiel is everywhere now what they do is that they get people to come together to design their games and uh, they put their games together uh, your board games primarily and then they give you all of this wonderful stuff they play test it they collect feedback they help you improve it they help others uh, you help others and then you repeat the process so it's quite a fun interactive thing and uh, yeah so you can attend and be a designer a play tester a publisher or, or just a volunteer to help sort out things uh, so if you are someone who wants to design board games or who wants to design a card game or something like that you can jump in and yeah find proto spiel there are like I said, online, and um, chat to them and see what they say. And, and uh, yeah, Spiel is definitely German for play, uh, as a matter of fact. It's also uh, Afrikaans for play as well, Spiel, play. Um, uh, but it's as in the games we play. So there we go. Um, right. Now, um, so that's Project Spiel. That is Protospiel. I met them there. I didn't have an opportunity to actually play any of the games that they had helped to forge and create. But yes, it is It is something worth having a look into if you're trying to design a game and you're struggling. It's like, well, how do I test it? How do I test it? I'm not sure. So, well, here you are. Find Protospiel. They will uh, They will help you. Protospiel. They will definitely, definitely help you. Next question before I go somewhere else is uh, Crypt. <laughs> Crypt Critter says, do you have tips on making smaller adventures for a sandbox campaign quickly? Yes, someone has stolen the egg. There is a short adventure. Off you go. Who stole it? Why did they steal it? What is the egg? Where was it stolen from? Who was it stolen from? Why was it stolen? Where has it been taken to? What's going to happen to it once it gets there? The five W's and one H is going to be your guide for that. Just start with something odd. Just start with something odd. Why is everybody in town turning green and eating spinach? Go. Off you go. Let your players go. Huh? Please help her. My mother is on the ceiling. No, she's really, she's just standing on the ceiling and she's speaking in a strange language. Can you please help her? There's a little kid ran up to the party, complete sandbox. Why is the mother standing on the ceiling? Don't have a clue. What's happened to the mother? Not a clue. But as the PCs are walking towards the little village, they're going to be asking that kid, hopefully, uh, why, when did your mother start standing on the ceiling? Yesterday. Afternoon. Once the priest had finished visiting with her. Aha! The priest must be responsible for it. Perhaps, or perhaps it's her husband who actually wants to get her out of the way because he's having an affair with the milkmaid who is actually the priest's daughter and the priest was there to find out if or not the wife knew about the affair and so the husband put a poison into the wife's food which caused her to turn into an undead banshee and that's why she's standing on the ceiling. I, who knows? There we go. There we go. And the egg is lost in that five room building with a portal. Go. <laughs> right. Yes. And so there we are. So uh, just throw out a sentence and see where it goes, make it up on the fly. The players are going to be talking to each other all the time. Figure out the five W's and one H. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. That's all you need to do. You can fill in the blanks as you go along. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you is pretty cool. We've got 15 minutes or so before I come to an end for tonight. I snap the neck of the kid and say, for the glory of Sparta, 
Well, there we go. That's absolutely fine. Now, with a sandbox adventure, is this particular PC who murders kids is going to get arrested by the local town guard or hunted by bounty hunters because the father was actually the king who'd sent his son out to see what life was like as a peasant and now has discovered that the PC has murder hoboed his son. And as a result, there is a completely new adventure because the king has now issued a bounty of 50,000 gold pieces for the head of Danny Kriegbaum Larsen. And there's your adventure. So off you go. This particular company sent me a box of stuff to showcase because they are going to be launching a um, Kickstarter shortly, which I'll share with you because I think sharing is caring and Kickstarters are always fun. Now, it's called... Mar <clears throat> Let me try that again. It's called Master Monk Gaming. Master Monk Gaming. And they sent me this box. Now, this box is deceptively heavy. It's a very nice black club of box. Master Monk Gaming gaming very nice very nice black box and you sort of open it up and you go ha it is another box it is a wooden box inside of the box okay so we take that out it is a box oh my god okay we open the box to find a business card master monk there we go and a box! Yes! My favourite types of boxes! And another box! With dice! But it's a lot of boxes! It's a lot of boxes! And then we notice that these boxes have got little things. Now, I've spoken about these boxes before, but when I pop these apart, I now have a dice tray from my box. Well, that's very exciting. Let's go back to the first box that we took off. This is the lid of said box with this grey thingy in here. I press that out. And now that's where all of our pens get to be kept and stored. Pens and pencils and markers. Okay, so we're starting to get an idea of what this looks like. Then I'm going to close that up. I'm going to open up this one. Definitely sounds like a box full of dice. So when you open it up, it is a box. A nice wooden beveled box. And I open that up. And there's our dice inside, of course. They are green, so that's why they're keying out. But a very nice little set of dice that they included. But a nice padded little dice box. Which snaps shut like that. The other box, however... Mm, let's have a look at this. This one had me flummoxed. For a long time, for I am a bear of very little brain, as Winnie the Pooh once said. And so what you do is you then realize, ha ha, it's all magnets. It's magnets all the way down. But that still doesn't help you. So then you go, okay, well, let's have a look over here. And it's actually little pieces that come apart. They're all labeled one, two, three five, one, four, and you go, what? So let's see how this all fits together. Then you look here and you realize, well, these are numbered also A, B, C, D. How does this work? Well, there's an A on there. So we do that like that. There's a B on here. And so that goes there. Any idea, any idea where we're going with this? If you didn't watch yesterday's stream, there's the C, and that clips in there, creating this very odd shape. I don't know if this recognize this D&D tool. Until you bring the two sides together, and you get a Roman invasion tower for very small Romans. Then the back, then the front, and the base, and you have a portable dice tower. <laughs> it's absolutely awesome. And it works. Where the hell are the dice? Of course it works. I mean, there's gravity. They didn't have to worry about including that in the box. So we take our said die. Lift up our dice box. Drop the dice. And get a 12. Not exactly amazing, but there you are. So I know that this has been uh, this has been around. We've got dice towers, we've got boxes, we've got dice boxes and pen boxes. But what I particularly liked was the whole thing fell, folds down into that very small little space. And I think that that could be pretty, 
pretty fun to uh, have around and to use if you like dice towers. I do like the dice box. It's got leather on the inside. It's not, f it's not um, uh, felt or anything like that. It's it's actually f um, leather, which is which is great. I don't know if you can see. On the edge there you see the the leather on the inside um but anyway it does have leather inside so that's really cool i do like that what i also like is that the magnets are quite strong they're not gonna eh, they're not gonna fall out which i really do appreciate because sometimes you kind of get this magnetic stuff and you go oh that's not oh and then it falls apart this stuff is actually uh is is very well put together so i do i do like that very much um, so yes, that is Master Monk. Now, what are they? Why are they sending me this cool stuff? They're sending me this cool stuff because this is their website. And so there's the dice towers. You see, it comes in a whole bunch of different types of wood, and you can stain it however you so choose, or they will stain it for you. Uh, you can really just just go mad. And uh, so it's MasterMonkGaming.com. MasterMonkGaming.com. Now these with this little panel insert, Perspex panel insert with their logo on. Really cool logo, I kind of like that. These are what they're gonna be kickstarting. Now you're seeing a Kickstarter preview page, so you can join it. You see I have saved it. There's already 370 people lined up for when this launches, which is soon. It's gonna launch mid-March and run until April. This is for this really cool uh, windowed box. Now what I like about this is, as much as I like this for keeping dice in, it's really cool. But if I've got four or five of these, it's like, well, are these my fighting dice? My GMing dice? My role-playing dice? My diplomacy dice? Or my random collection of dice which I'll lend to my idiot friends who've forgotten to bring their own dice? Short of writing on the wood, which you really don't want to do because it's beautiful wood, these will allow you to see inside, and I think that's a really, really, really great idea. So this is a cool Kickstarter. These guys are doing some really, really fun stuff. Get on over to their actual website itself. That's mastermonkgaming.com. You'll see that they've got a whole bunch of different uh, products that you can pick up. Different dice trays, mini trays, and then this wonderful Oracle Oracle set. So there you are. Now, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. I have shared, I have cared, I will be using most likely not the tower, but definitely the tray and the box uh, in the near future, because I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, the time is flying. We've got seven minutes left. So, what would gravity in a box look like? It could be, uh, could it be a game item? Uh, it could be. It could be a game item, I guess. I guess. Um, I think gravity in a box, I think it would be like this swirly purpley thing that looks like it's filled with stars. So, yeah, there you are. Now, uh, Seth Losher says, first live YouTube I've ever watched. Well, Seth, thank you for watching this particular one. I do appreciate it. Uh, hit the like button if you liked what you saw, and hopefully we'll see you again next week uh, for uh, another one. And maybe you'll watch more. Now, we are moving forward. Watcher2417 says, What do you think of the time frame for your sentence of your first book? What do you think of the time frame for your sentence of your first book when the song was sung? I thought of the song Hoist the Colours by Pirates of the Caribbean 3. What do you think of the time frame? Wait, I'm completely, completely confused. Watcher 2417, please don't. If I, what do you think of the time frame for your sentence from your first book? You talk about epic campaigns when the song was sung and you thought of Hoist the Colors. Well, I mean, the Hoist the Colors is a great song. Pirates of the Caribbean 3 had a great soundtrack. Hans Zimmer uh, stepping in for Klaus Bedelt, who uh, helped write the first Pirates of the Caribbean music. Klaus Bedelt happened to be Hans Zimmer's protege and understudy, who then went on to go and do Pirates, and then they kind of didn't fire him, but they kind of got Hans to come in and make it bigger, and Hans and Jerry Brockheimer have worked together forever, of course, they're thick as thieves, so Jerry said to Hans, hey, come and do my music, I don't like Klaus, he's your understudy, even though I think Klaus's music was a bit more original, then anyway, let's not go there. 
uh, I like classical music and music from the films. AK Writer says, with more and more countries in Europe going full lockdown, I was considering to offer online GMing as a means to enjoy the larger amount of home time a bit more. What's your take on that? Absolutely, AK Writer. Look, a lot of people are going to be working from home. Just because you're in self-quarantine doesn't mean that you have to stop working. It does mean that you've got more free time, though, because that commuter's taken out. So, yes, that's one of the reasons why I said, well, let's, let's talk about online gaming and, and what your options are. Because I think people are going to have a lot of free time on their hands moving forward. And so why not role play? Why not? It's absolutely, absolutely easy. Uh, Crypt Critter. Crypt Critter says, planning on running an adventure in a dream with higher leveled versions of the PCs. Any advice on this? Yes, because it's a dream, you need to make sure that they are aware that it's a dream. There's often those moments where in films and things they go, oh, it's actually, I'm in a dream, but I don't know how to get out. How do we wake ourselves up? We've got to figure out how to wake ourselves up. So if you let them know that they're in a dream, that's what they're going to try and do. Is they're going to try and get out of the dream because they're going to wonder what they're doing in the dream. If they're in a dream and they're running a higher, uh, the higher th themselves, why are in that? Why are they in that dream? What is inducing that dream? If the players are, if the players are just in a dream and you want them to have fun at a higher level, that's okay. But it could be a little like a waste of time. It's like what the whole thing was a dream. Why did we do it then? If someone has put them into the dream so that they can meet the little girl who says, are you my daddy? At the end of the dream, and then they all wake up and they go, who the hell was that little girl? Now they've got an adventure to, 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 to lead from that. And the dream suddenly says, ha ha, now we know why the dream was there to meet the little girl. And why did we meet the little girl? And so there we go. So if it's supposed to be a prophecy, as you say, Make sure that there are there are reasons for them to have that vision in the first place. Fumes coming up from the floor. Uh, there needs to be an instigation as to how the character or characters who have this dream, how they know about the future. Is it the gods? The gods could very well be, you know, muddling and mixing around and and doing stuff with their with their dreams. It's entirely possible to do that. No reason not to. So that is something to think about. Uh, okay, Christian N, three minutes to go, says, how to deal with a DM or campaign that kills PCs and we don't have time to attach or role play? Christian, exactly what you've just said to me needs to be said to the DM. Hey, we enjoy you running the game, but our characters die before we have any time to role play. If the DM shoots back, well, think better and be better and don't die... Perhaps it's time to find a different GM. And I'm not joking. Or get somebody else in your group to GM whom you think is more in alignment with you and see whether that DM will be willing to play with you. Either way, I mean, the the, bo the bottom line is, is that we talk about cultural alignment in role-playing games. And by cultural alignment, it is your DM, if they expect you to play better and to be Bear Gryllis whilst running around a dungeon... And they don't give you any slack for not being a survival expert with an entire television production team waiting around the corner to make sure he doesn't die. All of that kind of stuff. Uh, it could be a cultural misalignment. The GM is a simulationist. You perhaps are more of a storyteller, uh, a narrative-based role player. So you need to find a GM who fits that narrative. Or you guys need to become simulationists and it doesn't sound like you want to. So switch it around literally but speak to the gm first and i i know it's i know it's difficult i really really know it's difficult to turn to the DM and say listen but don't turn in anger turn and say we want to have more fun we want to really get into this something that we're having difficulty is we keep dying so often that we don't have time for all play so that's how i position it try try go that route Tom Bricks, I think this is going to be the last question. Tom Bricks says, question, TPK, should I do one for the last sessions? The players will fight a beholder. Tom, you seem to think that you have the power to cause a TPK if that's because you simply add so many monsters and things to the encounter that there's no ways the players could ever possibly survive, then go for it. But if you want your players to come back for more and feel like heroes... Set the adventure, set the, the, the creature. If you want them to win, you can obviously let them win. That's easy enough. If you want to kill them, you can kill them. Um, it really, really does depend on the players and what they're, what they're thinking. Now, someone is shouting at me from across Twitch. 
And yes, I should do this. So thank you for, for shouting at me for that particular reason. If you are looking for a group to play online, there are many online resources where you can try and find a group. However, one that we made specifically for you, and by we, I mean myself and my business partner, the Web Goblin. Actually, he did all the work. I just said, do this, do that, we do that, is rpgtablefinder.com. www.rpgtablefinder.com. There are 25,000 players players currently on rpgtablefinder.com they're all looking for games to play you can set up a table you can chat with each other you can do all sorts of wonderful things within this app go and have a look and it's free we are not charging for it you can use it as you like there are some tiers now that you can actually pay for where you get exclusivity you get to promote your table so that others might get to see it amongst all of the other tables that are out there but it is free to use so knock yourselves out have fun we are always on this channel about how to make the role-playing game better better and that does not mean cost more unless there are actual costs so yes we pay for a server and that sort of thing but that's all paid for by you guys watching the show watching those ads in front of youtube videos i know it's annoying but that's how the channel gets funded so that means we can keep things free right until next time i want to wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming i'm going to go over to twitch right now so that i can set up a raid because that's what one does. Uh, one raids. We'll be raiding into uh, the World Anvil show. World Anvil is doing their show right now. So I'm going to start that raid going. Jump in. Uh, wait, what? Uh, starting raid. Oh, they've moved the button now. Okay, excellent. 30 viewers are ready to raid with World Anvil. Go and have fun with them. Give them a shout out. And for all of you who are on YouTube... Have a great week. We'll see you all next time. And so from me, I have to say to all of you, the happiest of games. <laughs>